Hi, and welcome to TPI's podcast, To Think Minimum. Today is Tuesday, October 30th, 2018, and I'm Scott Walston, President and Senior Fellow of the Technology Policy Institute, here with Tom Leonard, Senior Fellow and President Emeritus of TPI, and we'll be chatting with Mitch Glazer, who's President of the Recording Industry Association of America, and David Israelite, President and CEO of the National Music Publishers Association. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure. It's an exciting time for music policy with the Music Modernization Act finally becoming law. And we're going to talk a lot about that. But first, before we start, maybe each of you could uh, take a minute to introduce yourself, explain what your organizations do and how they differ from each other. I am Mitch Glazier. I'm president of RIAA. We represent the major global music entertainment companies on the recording side. And we represent about 85% of all the legitimate recordings that are produced in the U.S. And I'm David Israelite. I run the NMPA, the National Music Publishers Association. We represent all of the music publishers and their songwriter partners in the United States. So we're the other copyright in the music industry from the sound recording copyright that Mitch and his organization. Together, we make up the two copyrights that make up music. Okay, well, we were hoping that you were uh, uh, the world of music licensing uh, understandable. And maybe you will entertain. So we're here primarily to discuss the Music Modernization Act, which was signed by President Trump on October 11th. And I think one or both of you have called it the most significant improvement uh, in music copyright in a generation. So why do you say that? Well, it's the only music legislation that's happened <laughs> in a generation, like <laughs> but it also is significant. This legislation tackled several different problems that exist in the music industry, and we were able to come together with a formula that got buy-in from really all of the major stakeholders in the industry, not just the people who make the music, but also the people that license and use the music. And I think that one of the things that is so remarkable about this bill is that it passed with unanimous support in Congress. It passed the House initially 415 to 0. It then passed the Senate 100 to 0. It went back to the House and passed unanimously again. And when you're talking about copyright policy or even music policy, the idea that all the interest groups, the record labels, the artists, the songwriters, the publishers, the PROs, the unions, the broadcasters, the digital music companies would all agree on these types of improvements is, is remarkable. So what, what are the major problems that it solved? On the licensing side, which David can address, it makes a licensing system that's fit for purpose in the street. And he can give you a lot more of those details. But it also fixed a couple of loopholes that have existed in the law for a very long time, especially for legacy artists. You know, because on the sound recording side, we didn't even have a federal copyright until 1972. We had a bifurcated system where every sound recording made before that year was protected under a patchwork of state laws. And everything made after that year was protected under federal law. And so you had that combined with federal licenses where there was a mismatch, not only in the rules, but potentially in the right to be compensated. And we had an odd situation where a legacy artist who was singing a recording that everybody knows, loves, and streams all the time was not getting compensated, but a contemporary artist singing the exact same song was getting compensated. And so Title II of the bill, the Classics Act, fixed that problem. And it basically brought pre-72 and post-72 sound recordings into harmony so that they're treated very similarly under the law. So it did that, but it also addressed problems in terms of its basic licensing arrangements for the streaming service. And what was the problem that, that it solved? It did. I think it's probably fair to say that if you wanted to summarize why this bill passed, it involved a trade. The trade basically was that digital services were having problems licensing the songs that they need to run their services properly. Services like Spotify, Apple, Amazon, Pandora, Google. And the music industry came together and came up with a solution to that problem. And that solution was traded for several things that we wanted out of those same services. And so so the basic trade was that we have completely changed the way that they license music in exchange for several different things which ultimately are designed to compensate songwriters, music publishers, legacy artists, artists and record labels more fairly. And that became the compromise that existed within the bill. The problem that these services were having is that they wanted to offer basically all music to their consumers, but they were required to go find the fractional owners of every single song and maybe a 
50 million song database. And if they didn't do that properly, they opened themselves up to copyright infringement claims. And quite honestly, there was a conflict there because we wanted them to be able to offer a wide variety of music. We wanted this to be an attractive proposition for consumers to buy music subscriptions, but they were having a difficult time. And some would suggest they weren't trying hard enough, but they were not properly licensing the music by finding these fractional owners and making license agreements. What we've done in this bill is replace that old system with a modern, simple way for them to get access to all music. They will now get a blanket license. They will pay all of the money and give all of the information to a new not-for-profit entity. And that entity's job will be to find the proper owners and distribute the money properly, but it will be done in a collaborative way that's designed to make us business partners and not in a way that really drove us down the path of being litigants against each other. Let's make it more concrete. You know, so how are songwriters likely to be affected? How much will, you know, the streaming services, how does it affect them? And what happens to consumers? Sure. So for songwriters, this is basically going to improve their lives in four different ways. And this is assuming they're not also an artist that's affected by the parts that Mitch was able to achieve for the artist and record label committee. Two of the ways that it helps songwriters is with regard to how they collect their public performance money. And so if you're a songwriter, you join a performance rights organization or a PRO. The two largest ones in the United States are called ASCAP and BMI. Those two organizations have been regulated by consent decrees at the Justice Department since 1941. Two of the things that this bill does is strengthen the ability of ASCAP and BMI to get better rates for the songwriters and music publishers they represent. The other two things it does for songwriters has to do with a different type of right that they have, known as a mechanical reproduction. That right has been regulated under law since 1909, when Congress thought that music publishers had a monopoly on player piano roles. And so this will help songwriters and music publishers get fairer rates for that type of activity as well. And the way that we've fixed the licensing system not only benefits the digital companies, but there are significant benefits for songwriters as well. For example, the digital companies are now going to pay 100% of the cost involved in the licensing system. That means that unlike any other licensing collective in the world, this one will not be taking a commission out of the royalty pool before it distributes royalties to songwriters. They will get 100% of what the royalty is. Every other type of collection method in the world, the songwriters are paying for that process and can lose anywhere between 10 to 20 percent of their money. We also are creating a public database that will allow people to recognize when their songs aren't being matched properly and to fix any problems that exist. And it gives us an audit right to go into the digital companies and ensure they're paying us properly. All of these are things that will benefit songwriters, all being given to us in exchange for building this new system that benefits the digital companies. And so the recording industry, though, 100% of the royalties are going to the songwriter. Where does the recording Well, industry? to be clear, 100% of the royalties owed to songwriters uh -huh. and music publishers. Okay. So, maybe that gets, so I want to get into all those details in a second, but let me ask a couple of questions first. Is it an oversimplification to say for the uninitiated that the basic problem, there were two basic problems. One is the songwriters and the producers of content were in a significant way not getting paid and it was falling through the cracks. And then on the other side, the digital streaming services were getting sued. And it's supposed to basically solve those two problems. Well, I would also add that you not only have the problem of them not getting paid at all when there were mistakes being made or people were missed, but those that were getting paid weren't getting paid fairly. And this addresses that as well, because it addresses what the rates actually will be for the songwriters. And also for the uninitiated, if you're a digital streaming service like Spotify, how many licenses do you need to have? So if you're a digital interactive streaming service like a Spotify or an Apple, you need three basic licenses. The first license you need is from a record label for that sound recording. That's negotiated in a free market. There is almost always a single owner of that one sound recording. And so you go and sit down and negotiate a price or terms, and you get a license for that sound recording from one owner from the record label or potentially an artist representing themselves. You then need two licenses from the songwriters and music publishers. One is a performance license, and one is this mechanical reproduction license regulated by law. To get the performance license, you go in America to four different companies and get a blanket license from each of the four, but that doesn't require that you know who owns what song on the publishing side. It's the mechanical license that's been the problem, because in that licensing exercise, you need to know every fractional owner of every song. And that's where the system was really breaking down. But for a Spotify, they need three licenses. One negotiated in a free market with record labels, one that's taken from four different PROs, but two of them are under consent decrees, 
that make up the vast majority of the market. And then there's the mechanical license where the price is set by law. The publishers don't have a right to say no to the license, but there was a broken down system in, as to how you achieve getting the license. And that's what we have fixed within this bill. And there's one more piece on the recording side. If you're not an interactive service, if you're not a Spotify, but you're what we call a radio-like service or a non-interactive service, a Pandora or a Sirius XM, you don't negotiate in the free market. Instead, you get to take advantage of a compulsory license that is administered by a copyright royalty board at the Copyright Office. And there was a lot of friction within that system because Congress enacted laws that reflected snapshots in time based on technology that existed at the time that Congress enacted the law. And so different radio-like services were paying under different rate standards. And those rate standards were inconsistent with the rate standard that is used for the mechanical license that David was referring to. And one very significant piece of the Music Modernization Act is that it made the rate standard under all of the government licenses a willing buyer, willing seller rate standard. What a willing buyer would pay a willing seller in the marketplace based on real data from the marketplace for services that do have to negotiate in the marketplace. And that was very very important for music publishers, for record labels, for artists, for songwriters, that they're finally guaranteed fair market rates, regardless of the platform and regardless of whether or not someone is negotiating in the free market or using a government license. That simplicity and fairness across the board was an incredible achievement that's been around for years. So, David, you started talking about the Music Collective and the database, which are kind of at the heart of this of the, of the provisions that are supposed to address this problem. So, the Music Collective, as I understand it, is supposed to collect the money, collect the royalties, and distribute them to the people who are supposed to get them. Talk a little bit about the process of setting up this uh, this Music Collective. Uh, who's going to do it? All these things. Sure. And I think it's important to understand how it worked in the old world to understand what the new world is going to mean. The way that it was working is that if you were a digital streaming company like a Spotify or an Apple, you would hire a vendor that would be responsible for helping you find the owners of the songs. So if you were a Spotify, you would get the sound recording from a record label, you'd put it up in your library, and then your vendor was supposed to help you identify who you owed the money to because the rate was set by statute and it was a compulsory license, but you you had to know who to pay because if you didn't, you technically were a copyright infringer. The vendors that were being hired each had their own databases to try to help the digital services. So Spotify and Apple, for example, used one vendor. Amazon and Pandora used a different vendor. Google used a third vendor and then just bought that vendor and it became part of their company. And so you had this patchwork of different databases held by private companies that were considered proprietary, that were considered confidential, that were being used to try to do this matching function. We know that despite best efforts, they weren't doing a great job at it because the information wasn't readily available. What the new system will look like is that this will be done now in a collectivized single place of this MLC. And what is really groundbreaking about it is it will be done in a very open and transparent way. So the new MLC will still be using vendors to do the same types of things. The difference is, is that when you solve one of the puzzle pieces for a particular song, you're going to solve it for all the services at the same time, not have potentially the situation where one service knows the right answer, but another service doesn't because they use a different database. The database that the Music Licensing Collective is going to oversee or put together will be open to everybody? It will be open to everyone. It will be transparent. And we are going so far as to say that anyone can have a copy of it if they want to. We are going to try to fundamentally change the nature of how we treat data in the music industry. It will be, to my knowledge, the only one of its kind in the world where we are not going to treat the ownership information as proprietary or confidential, but rather as public information that is designed to get proper payment. And so if, in fact, the MLC is unable to find the proper owner, what they they will do is they will publicize the particular sound recording, the fact that they couldn't find the right owner, and that will then start a three-year open window where anyone can look into this database and try to help correct the information or improve the data. Every music publisher will be incentivized to do a direct feed into the MLC with their own data because they're going to want to get paid properly. And then through this process of also crowdsourcing, in effect, the information, we're hoping that we can change the culture in the music industry because everyone has 
has a responsibility to get this right. And so from songwriters and producers and artists in the studio to their record labels and music publishers to the digital services that use it, we all have a responsibility to try to get this right. And we think the best way to do that is to put sunlight on the entire process and have everyone help solve the problems that exist. So who actually will be running this? So the law calls for an MLC to be blessed by the Copyright Office. There will be applications to be this MLC, and NMPA will lead an industry application on behalf of the music publishing and songwriting industry. It will be a not-for-profit entity. It will be a new organization, and it will be governed by 14 music publishers, 10 of whom are traditional music publishers, and four of whom have been defined as self-published songwriters. And this was an agreement made within the songwriting and music publishing community about the best way to establish governance of this new entity. This new board of 14 music publishers, four of whom by definition will be songwriters, will then hire staff, they will hire vendors, and they will be funded 100% by the digital companies that are going to use the blanket license. And how will the fees be set for how much they have to pay? So the way that we've worked that out is that we are currently hoping to negotiate by agreement a launch budget for this new entity. And so we in the digital companies have hired a joint consultant. They actually are sitting in my office right now, a block away, and we are working through trying to come to an agreement of what the budget should be to get it off the ground. The legislation, however, has worked in, obviously, that if we are unable to come to an agreement, then we go to the same copyright royalty board that sets the rates for record labels for performance or the mechanicals for publishers, and that three-judge panel will set the budget for the MLC. Okay, so the MLC gets established, it gets approved by the Copyright Office, and it's it's up and going, and then they, they have to put this database together, which is a big task. It's not an easy task, right? Herculean task. I mean, how many songs are there? How many hmm. pieces of music are I mean, you take a typical streaming company and you're looking at somewhere potentially of 40 to 50 million songs with thousands being uploaded on a daily basis. And so it is a growing problem. And thus far, is it fair to say there has never really been a successful database put together for the music industry? I would agree that there has never been a successful database. And I think it, it's important of how you define success. I don't want to pretend that the MLC's database is going to be perfect. It won't. There will be songs for which we fail to find the proper owners, and they go into what's known as the pending and unmatched category. That then starts the three-year public window of trying to figure out the answer. And one of the things the legislation does that's a massive improvement over the status quo is that ultimately all of the royalties will make their way into the songwriters and music publishers' pockets, whereas under the old system, if a digital company couldn't find the owner, the money was stuck at the digital company, which not only made the digital company an infringer, but it meant that there were royalties not flowing into the industry. I think it's important to set some context, too, for the music industry. It's not like the insurance industry where you're dealing with a whole bunch of decentralized companies and you're wondering why each company can't get together, share their data, agree on a form, and then come up with a master database. It's very different when you have two songwriters who might be sitting in someone's living room and it's not like they are sending in a form somewhere about their creative process or a hip-hop artist walks in with a song mostly complete or with an idea into a studio where a producer is then contributing and is now a co-writer on that song. There may be 12 writers, co-writers on that particular song. It's not like when you walk out of the studio after finishing the creative process, you know, you have a time punch card that you log in and it goes to some magic place. And so it's not that the music industry sort of fail to some oh, have some big that, database. Actually. But one great thing, and I think that, that David hinted at this about this new MLC, is that it's important that it be of and with the music industry so that over time, as David said, with transparency, people understand that when that window is left open, they have an incentive to try and get the right data right. to the MLC so that it will keep improving and people will start to understand that this is going to help them get their royalty. And so hopefully this is the start of a cooperative music ecosystem, as David said, where people are in business together with incentives instead of litigating against each other so that it starts propelling us towards that ultimate goal of a real database that not just connects musical works, but also sound recordings with them. So what if I'm, I'm, I'm an artist, maybe I'm a big deal type artist and I've got a, a company that's already managing my rights and I'm happy. Can I keep that arrangement? 
Sure, absolutely. In fact, I suspect that there's going to be even more what's known as direct licensing between copyright owners or representatives, the publishers, and the digital services that doesn't use this MLC. Um, We encourage direct licensing. We think it's more efficient. The benefit of this new system is, number one, even if you want to... They would still be eligible for the CRB determined rate or the the negotiate their rate. It's a statutory rate. Right. In in the music publishing industry, there are no negotiations over the price when you're talking about interactive streaming that's under Section 115 of the Copyright Act. Now, there may be other parts of a service that do require negotiation over price, but for purely interactive streaming, it's going to be statutory. The difference with direct licensing under the new system is that, first of all, if you have the blanket license as a insurance policy, then as a digital company, you don't have to worry that you missed something, which is often the case even when you do all direct licenses. I mean, if you consider the current companies doing this, many people think Apple is best in class in terms of their efforts to license. They do all direct licenses. They pay above the statutory rate, yet they have a class action lawsuit pending against them because of this problem. Even if you do direct licensing, that has to be reported to the MLC. So the direct licensing system will still feed the database, even though the money may not flow through the MLC entity itself. In terms of the blanket license, if you you can't just, let's say, I'm, I don't want the MLC to do it for me. I'm going to withdraw. So if my stuff is not covered by the blanket license, I'm doing it this other way. Is that, that's not possible. You, this, this may sound counterintuitive to you. I wish you could, but no, you can't. You right. cannot withdraw from the compulsory license. You know, I would like to live in a world without a compulsory license, but if forced to live with one, I want it to work. And so, you know, you can't withdraw your rights, but you are free to do direct licenses, direct deals around the MLC if both parties want to do that. And that, quite honestly, is a very common occurrence and will be even more so after the MLC is established. So there are a variety of efforts. I'm sure you know them better than I do in terms of to form databases, put together databases. What's going to happen to those? Well, first of all, they'll have the benefit of the MLC database, which is a public concern that they can use to try to use to improve any database they want to make for themselves. Secondly, I think a lot of those efforts will become less valuable because the information will be at the MLC in public. So, you know, the beauty of the MLC's database is not dependent on a particular technology. It's not dependent on really even participation necessarily. It's a growing living database that will constantly try to improve, but anyone is free to take it and do with it and build onto it anything they'd like to do. So we have these things in the music license, the compulsory license, the blanket license, which we really don't have elsewhere, and even in the world of intellectual property rights. Is music different to, that it needs this or it has this, or is it just a matter of history and, and we're on a trajectory? I would give two answers to that. First, it's unique and different, no question about it, but it's unique and different for a couple of reasons. First of all, it wouldn't matter to a music publisher or a songwriter what you call their type of license mechanical performance synchronization if the music publisher and songwriter were just in a free market. The only reason these distinctions matter is because what you call it changes then how the price is set and how it's regulated by the government, whether it's a compulsory license under law, a consent decree license at the Justice Department. If it were all just a music license for a song, we'd love to get rid of all these distinctions. So part of this is the historical building upon block upon block of things that don't make a lot of sense today, but we are forced to live with. The second part of this, which I think is a fair question, is why do you have to deal with music publishers at all? Why can't you just take a record label license and have the publishing license embedded in it like other types of intellectual property are? And I think for that, it's because of the uniqueness of songwriting. Songwriters have always had a unique copyright. In fact, it existed before there were sound recordings, and it's important that their intellectual property be licensed directly and not embedded in someone else's product, which is why you have two different licenses in the music industry, but you don't see that in other areas of intellectual property. And you do have a long history, different rights, and a lack of rights between them, which has contributed to this and which had to be taken into context to try to fix it. As David said, you had a copyright in a song before recordings ever even existed. And then when recordings did exist, they were not given rights by Congress because broadcasters didn't want to pay for those rights. So they were never given a federal right, which led to the premium 
1972 dilemma. And so you had to have a system for years and years and years where a songwriter negotiated directly with a distributor because the sound recording owner didn't have any rights to negotiate. And so they had to have their rights compensated. Uh, you can't have, you know, a, a, a contractual uh, relationship with somebody who doesn't have the rights to negotiate. So they had to negotiate for their own rights. And once that was established, we had to figure out a way in the streaming world for all of it to be accommodated, where everybody got paid fairly, where both rights, which does make it unique among other uh, types of copyright, uh, are recognized, and where the gaps are filled. And I think the MMA did a pretty good job of trying to fill holes where we could come together. And there are still holes out there. It's not perfect yet. There's still work to do. But we got together as a community and we identified the pieces where we could bring the parties together and we could be, move forward. And we did. So if we have one or two minutes left, let me, if you don't mind, let me switch subjects. You talked about the, the consent decrees. We have an assistant attorney general for antitrust who doesn't like, who says he doesn't like consent decrees like that, long lived consent decrees. Do you expect him to reopen that issue or... Well, I think it's an issue that needs to be looked at. Since 1979, the Justice Department has had a policy that any new consent decree must sunset within 10 years. Unfortunately for songwriters, they didn't apply that 1979 policy retroactively to the two consent decrees from 1941 that never end. And at the time they were put in place, they were put in place to protect a fledgling broadcast industry against the power of the songwriters. If you think about it today, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, the antitrust laws are being used to protect those companies against songwriters. It's absurd. And so I think that many people that want the consent decrees to continue want that not for any antitrust reason. They want it because it allows them to pay songwriters less than they deserve. And so I'm very glad that the Justice Department is willing to take a look at these issues. I think they're complicated and I think they're contentious. But ultimately, I think that songwriters, like any other type of small business owner, should have a right to negotiate the price of what they create in a free market. And the consent decrees prevent that. I'd like to, I guess, conclude by asking a question that doesn't really have anything to do with policy. I mean, this is an industry where everybody observes some part of it because everybody listens to music. You know, I wonder, for most of us, when we interact with other people for various things we do, you know, we're not going to put their pictures on our wall because nobody wants to see that. So, you know, I guess the question is, how often do you interact with not just the small, you know, small business type musicians, who obviously that's the vast majority of them, but, you know, the, you know, the more famous musicians. And I think, you know, the real question is, are they interested in this stuff? Will they sit there and talk to you about intellectual property? You know, before the MMA, I would say that most artists, at least, you know, found it a little distasteful, frankly, to try to lobby for their own rights and for their own benefits. You know, they would rather lobby about something else that's important to them for other reasons. But what was so interesting about the MMA was how engaged artists and songwriters around the country became, not just for themselves, but on the recording side for their mentors who were not getting compensated, for a lot of artists who appreciate and understand the contribution that songwriters contribute and how they benefit from that contribution to fight for those songwriters. So regardless of which piece of the MMA you were interested in, there was more direct engagement by artists, including famous artists, in this fight than I have ever seen on any piece of intellectual property le legislation ever. And I think that the creative input and engagement and direct impact lobbying, where you literally had recording artists calling up senators and saying, this is important to me and here's why, was at the end of the day, what helped to push this over the line. I think that's absolutely true. We had an army of creators that got engaged in this process and there was a role for whether you were a brand new, unknown, small songwriter up to a mega superstar artist, they all played a role. And as Mitch knows well, some very high profile creators personally got involved in this effort that I think made a huge difference. I mean, I think it was a nightly occurrence that Mitch and I were on the phone with Ryan Tedder, who was personally lobbying senators. Steven Tyler was writing personal letters. John Rich was calling senators. Senators. Maren Morris was on social media talking about this stuff. They were spending a significant amount of their personal time engaging in this. And it was something I had not seen in my 14 years in the industry, the type of organic uprising from the creative class on the MMA. And I do believe it had a large role in getting us across the finish line. 
So do you guys expect any more copyright legislation in the next few years? <laughs> God, I hope not. <laughs> I do think that what we saw here as a formula for success was identifying areas where we can bring parties together with incentives on both sides. There are always going to be outliers, but if you find, you know, that issue that becomes ripe and Jupiter has to align with Mars a little bit. I mean, you have to, the right heroes have to exist in Congress. You, you, know, you have to, sometimes litigation brings people together because the risks of a winner or loser for the entire ecosystem is worse than if you try to come together on a legislative solution. I think that this formula will be looked at in the future as one that can work. And so I think that there is hope for achieving policy in copyright in general that probably was lost before this achievement. All right. Well, thanks very much. That was a fun conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys.